Greetings yet again to each and all, those who still care and dare to listen, and a wicked welcome to Mythophrenia, where you find talks and texts by Gnostic teacher John Lamlash on a range of topics relevant to the Terma of Gaia Awakening, the Sophianic view of life, Planetary Tantra, and the Calico War Party. I am recording this talk in the morning of October 2nd, 2016, under the title, The Sovereign Moment Revisited. Some of you may recall that it was exactly a year ago, a year and a day, to be precise, that I last uploaded any material on the internet, as has been my usual fashion for a good many years now. That talk, uploaded on October 1st of last year, 2015, was entitled The Sovereign Moment. Subsequently, I withdrew that talk, but other talks that I gave around that time last year, through July, mid-July, and into August and September, can still be found. You'll see that the portal page for Mythophrenia contains links to these talks, which concluded the cycle of my activities in the fall of 2015. For the purposes of orientation, it might be helpful if I make a few comments on these talks from last year by way of bringing you all up to date with where I am right now. During the month of July, I recorded four talks. The first was a reading of a sheaf of cut wheat from metahistory.org with some additional commentary. That is to say, I interpolated into the text I read a few comments here and there. I do consider this to be a valuable talk and perhaps well worth listening to, re-listening, or picking up for the first time if you are so inclined. One of the points I made in that talk, which I hold to be outstandingly important, outstandingly significant for the future of the human species, ahem, was stated in this way. The Aeon Sophia, she of the Aeons in the Pleroma, or core of this galaxy has two children, two offspring. Her first offspring were conceived or designed within the galactic core in consort with her partner and male counterpart, the Aeon Thelite. So the Sophianic vision story tells you the origin of the human species, plain, clear, and simple. It is a Gnostic answer. It is Gnostic intel coming from those who know, not merely who believe or speculate. Down through the ages, there have been those who know what is the origin of the human species, the human genome, the anthropine genome, or genomic plasm of the anthropos. And today, with the restoration of the Sophianic narrative, the fallen goddess scenario, anyone who cares to investigate can partake in that knowledge. Sophia and Thelite designed 
and calibrated the human genome in a precise way, which can also be known. And they did so in the core of the galaxy where the solar system we inhabit is currently located. If you wish to play along with that cosmological setting for the purposes of illustration and to see where it might lead by further investigation and even by involvement in the description, involvement in that description. So, first child, the firstborn of the Aeon Sophia was the Anthropos itself, the Anthropine species of which you are a specimen, as I myself am a specimen. There was a second child of the Aeon Sophia, the planetary animal mother, and that second child came to birth within her natural womb, you could say, within the setting of the natural world on Earth, once the anthropine plasm had been seeded upon the planet, which arose due to the transformation of the Aeon Sophia herself. This is knowledge. This is intel. This is a cosmological description. It is a passage from an astronomical myth. And as such, it's clear. It's clear and straightforward. The second child was born on Earth, and that child is not the anthropine species as such. Rather, it is the highest flowering of the genius of the species. That is to say, the Sophianic mysteries of the ancient world. So the mysteries were the second child of the Aeon Sophia. And the fate of the mysteries is something upon which the fate of the first child depends. Let me repeat that. The outcome of the evolutionary experience, the evolutionary trial and error of the anthropine species, humanity, depends upon the fate of that second child, the mysteries. I make that point in the reading of the she A Sheaf of Cut Wheat. You can also find a chapter called A Sheaf of Cut Wheat in not in his image. So looking back at it now with the benefit of one year and a day of hindsight, I can say that that was a pretty good presentation. The two other talks I gave, three other talks I gave in July, were of two different kinds. The tragedy of the mother stands in a class by itself. Following that came the parable of the extras and out of time. I would strongly advise anyone and everyone who takes my work seriously to go and listen to the tragedy of the mother. It is an outstanding expression of the Gnostic art of speaking to consciousness in terms of the design of consciousness. I won't say any more about it, except that it has a couple of outstanding points that might come up later on in the talk now underway. As for the parable of the extras recorded on 23rd of July and out of time on the 24th, 
Those are two talks which exhibit my difficulty at that time in knowing what to say and where to go next with the Gnostic message and the Sophianic vision of life. I consider these talks to be shaky, dubious. The teacher was certainly not at the top of his form there. You can detect some wavering and some wobbling. As I grope around, trying to find some tread, really, and trying to see which direction I might go with the Gnostic teaching that I've been developing over these many years now, since 2002, well, 14 years on the internet. Now, the parable of the extras is one of the five parables that are accessory to Mayavada Vedanta, which is a speciality of planetary tantra. And so the parable of the extras as such, the parable as such, is valuable to know and really useful and user-friendly. In fact, I can attest that... Uh, there are a good many people in Planetary Tantra today who speak in the jargon of that parable. So they refer to people as extras. That is to say, those people in your life, those actors in whatever roles they might be, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, husband, wife, child, boss, teacher, guru, student, lover, enemy, Whatever role they may have in your life, they are actually extras in the movie of your life if they are not playing a role that fits into the Sophianic narrative. If they are not aware of the narrative and they don't play a role, consciously choose a role within the narrative, then they are just extras. And so that particular metaphor or parable has proven to be quite useful, can be very entertaining at moments, and it's a good way to sort things out regarding the people in your life. As for out of time, you might recall that I speculated whether the world at large was going to catch up with me. That was a big question for me a year ago, in July and August and September. And it was a question I lived with at the time, without being able to answer it. Actually, as September came on, something extraordinary happened in the world. Something of imperative and dramatic significance happened in the process of Sophia's correction. Well, I must have been feeling it at the time because I was, let's say, intent upon bringing forth a message. But I knew that the manner in which I was attempting to do that was not correct. It wasn't lucid. Nevertheless, September of 2015, just a year ago, was a decisive moment in Sophia's correction. No wonder that I was wondering if the world at large was ever going to catch up with the Gnostic teachings I presented, which are of an advanced and sophisticated kind. And it wasn't until July of 2016, about 10 months later, that I realized what was happening.
In other words, what I sensed in September of 2015, but could not bring to clear definition, became obvious to me in July of 2016. And so it was at that time that I realized that I was probably going to return to the airwaves and to resume my practice of uploading talks and texts on the internet. You see that on the 31st of August last year, I gave a talk called Scratching the VV Itch. Some of the topics in that talk are closely related to those in the Sovereign Moment, which I am here going to review and reevaluate. In particular, the topic of witchcraft comes to mind. Oh, yes, it does. Indeed, it does. The topic of witchcraft is in the air. And I knew that last year and felt it strongly. I can remember vividly that in the September of last year, I was grappling with the theme of witchcraft and wondering how to present it within the framework of Sophia's correction. At the same time, I wrote some material on the subject of Lucifer. Lucifer and witchcraft are closely related themes, so it happens. I found myself at that time rather obsessed with the topic of Lucifer, and I felt compelled that I needed to get something off my chest regarding Lucifer. So I wrote some material, which I later withdrew, along with the Sovereign Moment talk. But the Sophia Lucifer material has been restored, and you can now find it by linking from the home page on metahistory.org. Technically, that material belongs to the first material that I am releasing under mythophrenia, but it is of such importance that it has its own separate access page. The true Lucifer is Sophia. That is a statement that cannot be repeated enough times. What I attempted to do originally in those writings on Sophia and Lucifer was not handled well. My first efforts were not satisfactory. And at moments I despaired even of tackling the material at all. There is so much corruption in the files on Lucifer. There is so much distortion around the subject of Lucifer, the devil, and Satan that I actually despaired at the prospect of correction and clarification. You know, that is the responsibility of an Gnostic teacher. A good part of an Gnostic teacher's work, a third of it, I would say, comprises correction and clarification of matters which have become confused or distorted or deliberately perverted. Well, that certainly applies to Lucifer and even Satan. So there are points in those talks which I consider too important to ignore. And even though I was, in a way, you could say, warned off the subject I ultimately decided to come around to it again because of a unique opportunity that now presents itself. A unique opportunity to talk about Lucifer and witchcraft in a way that I could not do a year ago. So here goes. This is 
the core material that I'm resuming in this talk on the Sovereign Moment Revisited. First and foremost, I direct your attention to the term, the Sovereign Moment, as I defined it then and as I would redefine it now. What I'm doing here in revisiting the subject is several things, but mainly, foremost, I am correcting myself. I withdrew the talk due to having detected in it a number of serious errors or misstatements. The first error is contained in the title itself. It is not the sovereign moment. It is her sovereign moment. At the time that I determined the parameters for her sovereign moment, that was to say in September of last year, uh, I was astonished and excited by my discovery, which I can reiterate to you in this way. Having presented the Gaia Navigation Experiment during three years between March 2011 and March 2014, I proposed that the moment of Sophia's correction foreseen in some Gnostic writings was actually underway. And I proposed in the frame of the Gaian navigation experiment, that there would be a period of three years equivalent to ten seconds of ionic time in which the Aeon Sophia would reset this experiment, the divine experiment unfolding on Earth. She herself, acting within the experiment, would reset it in ten seconds. So the Gaian navigation experiment was a process of monitoring and tracking the reset. Then, from March of 2014 onward, correction as such was underway. The world, be it known or not to many or most people, is living through the correction of the Aeon Sophia right now as I speak. And we're going on two years and six months now. So, once correction got underway, I was naturally curious as to how to track correction and how to navigate in correction. Remember that the GNE was an exercise of navigation in reset, but not in correction itself. Well, considering that correction is an awesome cosmic scale, an unprecedented event on this planet, the challenge of navigating through that process is a daunting one, needless to say. So, I had been asking myself since March of 2014, that is to say for about 18 months at that time last year, 18 months, been asking myself, well, would it be possible to track the events of correction in the way that I had tracked the events of reset? And I've given some indications of that here and there in a number of talks. Primarily, I've indicated that by following the transit of Jupiter through the constellations, you can track the major developments of correction, especially as they involve the consort of Sophia, Thelite. Jupiter represents Thelite in one respect. In another respect, Jupiter also represents the Terma of Gaia Awakening. It represents the consummate teaching on this planet, the consummate teaching to humanity of who humanity is, how it originated, what it is doing here, 
What are the interfering forces in the experiment underway? What is Anthropos 10, one version of the strain of the genomic plasm of our species? And what is Anthropos 11, the mutation arising out of that strain? And so forth and so on. So you see, there is quite an inventory of, let's say, uh, large-scale and loaded topics within the topic of correction. But being the navigator of the GNE, well, I necessarily wanted to see if I could maybe be more precise. Additional to following the passage of Jupiter through the constellations, I wondered if I might get some, might be able to determine some specific timing parameters regarding how correction unfolds. And I'd been asking that question and discussing it for quite some time with some of my buddies in Planetary Tantra. And there and then, in September of last year, just before the equinox, I hit on the data. I hit on the navigational intel. And that concerned the movement of Jupiter as it advances through the constellations of the zodiac in coordination with the south node of the moon. Now, without going into the particulars, the astronomical particulars, I'll just reiterate what I discovered. I saw that there was a time frame extending from January 2016 until August 8th or 9th, 2016. Well, I chose August 8th because that was the 8th anniversary of the Terma of Gaia Awakening. And for some particular reason, which I can't remember at the time, because these granular details can be fleeting and elusive in retrospect, for some particular reason, I designated the sovereign moment as the moment from, I think it was January 6th, 7th or 8th, around there, 2016, to August 2016. Those eight months, that was the sovereign moment. But I didn't say it was her sovereign moment. That was the mistake. And I made an additional mistake by making a claim or repeating a claim that I've made before. Perhaps uh, it came up in the GNE. I don't know. Yeah, I know it did. Um, this is one of these arrogant claims that Gnostics will often make when they're in a state of inflation or orchestration, as we like to call it. I said that as a Nahual, acting as a Nahual, that is to say a guy in shaman, I was going to command the first attention of the entire human species. Well, you know, I like to keep my claims and pretenses right out in the open. So, if I fulfill them, then I can stand with pride on what I said. And if I don't, then you'll know that I'm just blowing off some of my arrogance and the hot air of my all-too-human egotism. Although there might be some something in that hot air that might be some sails that could be filled with that hot air. But anyway, the point is, the claim that I made for myself doesn't really stand. I'm not entirely dismissing that claim, by the way. Let me assure you of that. An accomplished Nawal could command the first attention of the entire human species. It's something that can be done. I'm not saying that I'm going to do it. I'm pointing out something far, far more important than my pretensions in that respect. The sovereign moment for her was the moment when she securely gained command of the first attention of the human species. It was her sovereign moment. And during that period, 
especially in July and August, the culminating moment of that eight-month period, the Aeon Sophia achieved command of the first attention of the human species in such a way that she retains it. She now retains that command in full scope. I'm speaking to your imagination. The true and not the fantastic imagination. And I'm inviting you to consider significance of this event. So I find now, a year after having released my original talk on the Sovereign Moment, that I can make a statement, an assertion, a declaration of the highest import. I would say that this declaration is among the ten most significant pieces of intel that I have ever released as a Gnostic teacher. And it goes like this. As a result of accessing the first attention of the human species during her sovereign moment, the Aeonic Mother now has agency. The Aeonic Mother has agency in the current experiment. That is what was accomplished in the eight months of the Sovereign Moment, which I could not see when I detected the time parameters for the moment back then a year ago in September 2015. I sensed it, yes, vividly at that time, but I could not discern clearly what I was sensing. I picked up on my radar the operation of certain signals in the world at large, signals that were operating in the exopsyche, that is to say in the realm of the first attention, breaking through from the social subconscious or the endopsyche into the zone where they could be discussed and debated and considered and investigated and argued about. I sensed those phenomena happening, but I did not detect exactly how they were happening at that time. And so the conclusions or inferences that I made were inaccurate and to some degree misleading. I was correct on the theme of witchcraft. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I was. And yet I did not elaborate or elucidate that theme in a correct way. So what I'm doing now, by revisiting that talk, is to make the corrections clear to you as they have become clear to me. Now, touching on this subject of witchcraft, let me refer back to the talk of August 31st, scratching the VV itch. Because witchcraft was the central topic of that particular presentation. In particular, I alluded to a film that came out in 2015, among a number of films about witchcraft, or relating to TV series, HBO series on witchcraft, such as Salem. I noted that the film called The Witch, was an independently made film, had a peculiarity in the title, in the uh, font. The word witch in the title of the film was spelled with two V's that were slightly separated so that it could be read as the VV itch. And I thought at the time, I was startled at the time, by that 
particular little detail. And it raised in my mind the possibility that signals were coming out of the human subconscious, out of the endopsyche, in the form of little glitches like that, little graphic signals, and that these signals were indications of the power of the Aeon Sophia breaking through into the mundane and the ordinary world. After all, the film The Witch is just another in a long line of films about witches and warlocks and vampires, horror films. There is a huge um, trend, an enormous trend over the past few years. Uh, a trend of interest in, in witchcraft, in vampires, uh, there have been some really, really bad uh, TV films and TV serials based on those themes. In fact, uh, TV serials and mainstream films about witchcraft go back a long ways. So there's Buffy the Vampire Slayer, there's Charmed, it goes all the way back to the beginning of the days of television with Bewitched, which was a program about a young and benevolent witch in a middle-class family setting. So in the 50s, when television was introduced in the United States of America, the program included such films as I Love Lucy, which was a very popular comedy, the most popular comedy of its time, and uh, Bewitched, which was a comedy series about a witch. So these subjects, these topics, these themes, these memes are not in any way unfamiliar to the ordinary mind in the realm of the tonal, which is to say the mundane. They are factors glimmering out of the realm of the nahual, which is the paranormal and supernatural, and casting a spell, casting a fascination upon the realm of the tonal, which is where the first attention of the human species operates. So I was struck by this VV itch, and I thought, hmm, that's a message there. It's like saying the film The Witch is announcing that there is an itch for VV, that there is an itch in the human psyche and people are starting to scratch this itch. And those of us in Planetary Tantra who are savvy and informed about the Sophianic narrative would know why they are feeling this itch. So, on the basis of my Gnostic perspective, I inferred that something was happening, uh, that there was a cluing process underway, a cluing or cueing process that originates in the mind of the planetary animal mother herself. And through this cueing or cluing process, the signaling from the endopsyche into the exopsyche, she begins to effectuate her correction now that she has agency. Agency means that she can actually intervene in the current experiment. She has access. Access and agency go together. If I know how to drive a car, then I have agency to drive. Agency consists not only of the skill of driving, knowing how to manipulate an automobile, but also I am at liberty to do so. I am an autonomous being who is able to st step into an automobile, sit myself down, and conduct that vehicle. Agency consists, but there has to be an automobile there for me to drive, right? So agency consists of those three factors, the skill, the access to the vehicle or opportunity, and the opportunity itself. And what I sensed last year was that 
the Divine Mother had achieved agency at in the first five seconds of correction, that is, 18 months, she had achieved agency. But only now can I tell you what that actually means. Can I, can I communicate to you and convey to you the impact of what that means? The Aeonic Mother has agency. Well, what it means is simply that an act of divine intervention is underway. But this act of divine intervention on the planet Earth is unlike any other presumed act or unlike any act so far anticipated. I cannot emphasize those two points strongly enough. Let me repeat that. Let me put it in a conditional sense to make it more user-friendly. If there is indeed an act of divine intervention happening now on earth in the mundane ordinary world, reaching to the mundane ordinary world, due to the Aeonic Mother having achieved agency, then it will not transpire in the way of any previously presumed intervention nor in the way of any intervention so far anticipated or conceived. As a matter of fact, there's a trick proposition at play here. Would you like to know what this intervention is? Would you like to know what signs demonstrate that it is in fact underway? I can show you that. Would you like to have the syntax and the language to comprehend this intervention can provide that. Would you like to be involved in this intervention if it's conceivable to do so? Is the intervention a participatory event or is it a spectator event? Well, I can assure you, consistent with the framework of the Sophianic narrative, this is a participatory event. The Ionic Mother has agency, and the manner in which she performs on agency depends to some degree on the participation of her witnesses. Would you like to be one of those witnesses? Would you like to see how the divine intervention of the Aeon Sophia into this experiment is actually unfolding, then the first requirement you need to meet is to realize that it happens in a way that has previously been inconceivable. No previous notion, no previous scenario of divine intervention matches or reaches the actual fact of this intervention right here, right now. So you can only comprehend what this intervention is and bring yourself to some degree of participation with it by attaining a totally novel concept of it. The role of the Gnostic teacher is to present the inceptive bodhi, the bodhi chitta, that is to say, the inceptive concept of the experiment to be undertaken. Inception is a word in English that translates the Gnostic term pronoia. You may recall that there was a film released a year or two ago titled Inception, a bad film, an overcomplicated, muddled film, in my opinion. Uh, it represents, it comes from a director, a writer, who has also attempted on other occasions, such as uh, what, The Prestige, 
to delve into the realm of the paranormal and the supernatural uh, somewhat more successfully, I would say, in the prestige, which relies on the theme of the double or twinning, cloning, and uh, simulation, uh, somewhat more successfully in that film than in the film Inception, which is a mess. But the point is that, once again, efforts undertaken in the mundane and ordinary world by people who have no knowledge whatsoever of the correction of the Aeon Sophia are taking on the shape of correction, whether they know it or not. The Aeonic Mother has agency. She can command anything that happens in the realm of the first attention to follow her intention. She can command or direct any event, any phenomena, no matter how trivial, anything from the title of a film to the plot of that film, she can use to her purposes. That is what it means for her to have agency. Now, the film Inception is highly significant in this respect at least, as bad as it is, and it is a shambles. Uh, it demonstrates or illustrates the theme of entering into someone's dream. Inception means to go into someone's dream and plant a seed that comes to fruition in the waking life of that person. Well, what do you make of that? What do you see there? What you can see in that concept, in that plot structure, upon which the film Inception is based, is a distorted groping toward the lucid dream of the Aeon Sophia. A groping toward the experience of awakening in her dream, of knowing that you are living in the lucid dream of the planetary animal mother. This is one of the leading premises of planetary tantra, as you know. As such, it is absolutely unique and incomparable on this planet. No one else teaches it but me, so far. No one else teaches it publicly but me. All participants and devotees of planetary tantra are teaching it as they learn it. So inception is pronoia. And inception means insertion actively into the dream life of the Aeon Sophia. Well, that is where you already live in the first place. You just don't know it until the terma reveals it to you. Now, what does all this have to do with witchcraft? Well... If the Aeon Sophia is able to intervene directly, then witchcraft, put it in quotes if you will, might be the strange attractor by which you can begin to develop a totally novel and unprecedented concept of divine intervention. To put it in plain English, let's say that her intervention takes the form of acts of witchcraft. It is her witchcraft that I meant to be speaking of last year. I couldn't speak of it in the way that I can now due to the fact that I stand within it. Due to the fact that I detect it objectively and palpably operating in the world as I didn't at that time. It was supremely fortunate for me, the Nahual of Infinity Ridge, to have detected how her witchcraft is working during the nine or eight months of the sovereign moment. 
what I bring to you now and in any forthcoming talks in whatever form they may take will be an ongoing revelation of her witchcraft, of her divine intervention. One of the talks in Mythophrenia is called Silence is Her Name. And in that talk, I consider different concepts of divine intervention and I eliminate them one by one. Doing so, I clear the way for the actual event which is unlike any previously imagined act of divine intervention. Okay, enough said on that. I would guess I've made that point pretty clear. To round out this talk now, in the remaining 20 minutes, I need to go a step beyond self-correction and actually retract some things that I said in the talk on the Sovereign Moment last year. Doing so, I'm going to take the opportunity to teach you a really important term in the shop talk of Gaian sorcery and Gaian shamanism. That term is slighting. S-L-E-I-G-H-T I-N-G. So slighting is the gerund form of the verb to slight. S-L-E-I-G-H-T. Now please note that the word to slight, the verb to slight, the infinitive, should not be confused with something that sounds identical but is spelled differently. To slight, S-L-I-G-H-T, means to dismiss or discount, discount someone. Okay? And this is a fairly common term. Uh, I met so-and-so at a party and he slighted me. To slight someone is to dismiss them, to put them down, to regard them as being of lesser value than they actually merit. Slight, of course, also refers to a slim or narrow chance. There was a slight margin of error in the calculations. So, put aside the word slight, spelled S-L-I-G-H-T, for a moment, and consider it spelled with an E. The word slight, S-L-E-I-G-H-T, brings to mind the expression sleight of hand. A magician who performs parlor tricks and card tricks uses sleight of hand. Sleight of hand refers to dexterity in the use of, in the manipulation of gestures in order to perform an act of magic or to create the illusion of magic. Okay? I once coined the term sleight of mind for the equivalent of parlor magic, parlor tricks, but on the level of psychological magic, mind control, and psyops. A psyop, you could say, is a sleight of mind. 9-11 was a sleight of mind. S-L-E-I-G-H-T. Now, how specifically does this term apply? It's an extremely important term in the practices of Gaian shamanism because it represents a tendency that leads to error if it is not held in check. The tendency to slight defined in Gaian terms means to treat something that might be or could be as if it already were. That is called slighting. In a sense, it almost equates with exaggeration 
or extrapolation. I'll give an example of sliding in the current discourse on the internet. In the fall of uh, this year, there was a lot of discussion about the health of Hillary Clinton, and some people said that she was dead, and uh, so suppose that she is not dead, but suppose that it is desirable for her to be dead. It's desirable to think of her as dead. And so to claim that she is dead when she is not is slighting. It's not merely lying. It's not merely a mistake. You understand that it's a, it's a distortion of something that is very close to being true. Well, I'm guilty of slighting as well. In a number of comments that I made in the original talk on the sovereign moment, for instance, I declared that in fall of 2015, consonant with an omen in the sky, which was Venus Lucifer appearing in the crab, which I associated with the Aztec war goddess Ishpapalotl, consonant with that omen, the Calica War Party was activated. That is not true. The Calica War Party was not activated in the fall of 2015. I was slighting when I said so. Furthermore, I said that from that moment on, an open counterattack would be underway in public spaces against the enemies of life. Well, that turns out to be more or less true in certain respects. But I added that at the same time there would be a hidden or occult war undertaken, an occult counterattack against the psychopaths and the enemies of life who tend to run the game of social power on this planet, social power and influence. Again, I was slighting. It is in fact not so that there is a hidden or occult counterattack taking place at least not to my knowledge, and I am certainly not directing such a counterattack. I also declared in that talk that I would be teaching the skills and spells of tantric sorcery. Well, that's not exactly slighting. That's more like making a promise, ain't it? I made a promise, and... To the best of my ability, I'll see if I can keep that promise. I added also that the practices, the framework and practices of Kalika sex magic would be released in the near future. I made that claim, that promise, a year ago. Now, this is not exactly slighting. You can see it's close to it. If I say that I'm going to do something and I don't do it, then that is simply dishonest. That is simply a failure of follow-up. But without working too hard on the obvious, I think I can make the point here that slighting and making promises that I don't keep run together and mingle and can be confounded and confused even though fundamentally they are two different actions. So I'd like to retract my slighting remarks of the past and I'd like to say that as far as my promises go, well, the goddess, if the goddess uh, deems it so, then I may indeed present Kalika sex magic. Time is short. Time is of the essence. And whatever I can do, I can only do one day at a time. I will say, in reference to another comment that I made in the original talk, namely, that I have genuine occult power, I will say that that statement is correct. 
but not in the language as it now stands. How can I have genuine occult power? How can you have genuine occult power? How can anyone have it? The only way you can have it is in a power-sharing pact with the earth itself. There is no genuine occult power on this planet that does not rest or reside in a co-dynamic between the human agent of that power or magic and the supernatural or superhuman agent, which is the Aeonic Mother herself. This is a foundational principle of planetary tantra. Hence, planetary tantra can be defined as a power-sharing arrangement with the source of your life and your consciousness and even your identity. I repeat, the Aeonic Mother has agency in the ordinary dimension of the human mind. That means that she has access to the ordinary mind that people use to run their everyday affairs. I can show proof, or let's say evidence, and you yourselves can develop the proof. I can show evidence that she has such agency. I first detected this evidence through traces of subliminal signaling which I caught in September of 2015. Little did I know that there was at that time a surge of subliminal signaling, a wave of subliminal signaling breaking through into the ordinary mindset of humanity. I didn't know it, but in my prairie dog fashion, I picked it up. My little ears were twitching, my nose was twitching, even my little prairie dog tail was twitching in the dust. But I could not define to you exactly how she is doing this in the manner that I can now. If you want to participate in Sophia's correction, there are particular and rigorous requirements for doing so. The whole world, the entire human race, certainly is swept up in this event of correction. But it has a particular look and feel to those who are the conscious witnesses of the Nahual of the Wisdom Goddess. You select yourself into that witnessing process. You adopt the syntax to conceive it and track it. And ultimately, moment by moment, you become an active participant in her correction. This is a process that never ends in your lifetime. It's a process that unfolds every day in a new and startling manner. As regards the entirety of the human species in its threshold condition of mutation from Anthropos 10 to Anthropos 11, well, it's a process that lasts until the final moment of this kalpa, which is 2216 AD. So, in concluding this talk, I want to recall and restate a claim that I once made, which I hold to be true, and which I would affirm to you now is not merely a pretension, but is a fact. I claim to have accessed the mind of the planet itself. This I did on Infinity Ridge 
about 12 years ago, around the year 2004. As I have explained in various writings on Planetary Tantra on metahistory.org, I gained access to the planetary mind. At that time, which was a good 10 years prior to correction, the mind of the Aeon Sophia was still largely in an autistic state. So accessing her mind was like getting the attention of an autistic child. Having come through reset and into correction and having gained agency, well, the mind of the Aeon Sophia is no longer in an autistic state. It is dynamically operative in the lucid dream of the earth itself. The earth is having a lucid dream. You are a character in that dream and the moment for interaction between the characters in the dream and the supreme dreamer is now, right now. No other spiritual teaching, no other metaphysical message on this planet gives you such an orientation. No other teaching offers you such an opportunity as this one does. In restating that claim that I access the mind of the planet, I would add this. It's probably time for me to do a talk specifically on the objections that are bound to arise in the face of that claim. I understand, for instance, that there are some specimens of humanity who might react to that claim and say, well, wait a minute, John. How is your claim that you can talk to the mother goddess of the planet and speak for her and speak in her behalf any different than the claim of men who have told us through the ages that they talk to God as Moses and Muhammad and Jesus did and that they can talk in God's behalf to the rest of the human race. How is it any different? Well, it would certainly be, to say the least, entertaining if I dedicated a talk to explaining the difference and a huge and awesome difference it is but for right now, I would like to conclude with this message. I did indeed access the planetary mind. And having done so, I can assure you that that access is possible to any sane human being with a certain requisite level of intelligence. That is to say, you have to have a particular IQ. And I can also assure you that at the time that I accessed her mind, the Aeonic Mother herself did not have access to the human mind at the social level. Now she does. I can report that now she does. Having had access to her mind and become intimate with it over these last 12 or so years, I can assert that developments have happened in the sphere of her own intelligence the sphere of the planetary intelligence itself and the anima mundi, which is the emotional body of the planet, her psycho-emotional matrix, I can assure you that developments have happened in that realm that brought her to the sovereign moment when she gains agency. In the talk, her name is Silence, I go into more detail regarding aspects of this proposition. And I clarify exactly 
what are the conditions within which she can intervene. This you are required to understand. The intervention of the Aeon Sophia in this experiment is not a matter of faith. It cannot be a matter of faith or blind belief. It is a matter of gnosis, direct knowing, verifiable knowledge and participation. But in order to be an instrument of that knowledge, you are required to understand the conditions in which her intervention can occur. That is the great learning process. That is the steep curve of learning that you enter now with this new series of talks that come to you with a wicked welcome through the portal of Mythophrenia.